Good morning, everybody. Since Easter, I have met with almost all of you, 83 of you to be exact, in small groups to get us thinking about the need to find a sustainable future for our church. We have called that the Ecclesia Project. And I have to tell you that for me, it has been a deeply sacred and precious journey, a very rich and touching experience. You each got to hear the thoughts of a handful of fellow congregants. I got to hear the thoughts and feelings of all of you. The fact that you all wanted to participate speaks volumes in itself about your commitment to our church. Some of you have come to the church recently, found us on Zoom during a pandemic, and joined in with enthusiasm. At the other end of the scale are Molly Hilby and Ed Joy, both whose parents were members of the church and who were both baptized as babies in the 1930s and 40s in this very sanctuary. Their fathers knew each other and Molly's father took part in the setting aside of the second century fund, a fund we can look to during future financial need. I found out that there are many folks that have been with Westminster for 30 or 40 years or more. Some have been married here, some whose children were brought up here and married here as well, and some who have had memorials for their loved ones. Still some, like me, have come since Pastor Andy came to Westminster, and she is the only pastor we've known here. But whether you've been here a short time and a, or a whole lifetime, whether you've seen many ups and downs over long years or, who, or have arrived newly into our present vibrancy, I heard a consistent message. You love this church, this congregation, this beloved community. You love it with passion and fervor and enthusiasm. Molly Hilby, our lifetime member, said, this has always been my church and always will be. You call the church iconic. You call it scrappy. You call it friendly and safe. You call it flexible, right down to the grape and cracker in a paper cup for communion during a pandemic. You call it honest Christianity. You call it the body of Christ. What do you love about it? Most of all, you love the emphasis on living out our faith, walking our talk, followers of Jesus with the courage to stand up for justice and the energy to help those in need. You say the church helps you get outside of your comfort zone. You're proud that we were twice a warming shelter for the homeless, even though doing so was fraught with problems. You love that we share moral and social values and that we are strong together to go out into the community. Rob Sauter said that the first time he came here, there were people out on the sidewalk yelling at us and he knew he was in the right place. You also love the church community, the people, you say. You love that we are so intentionally LGBTQ plus welcoming you find it wonderful that you are so accepted here. You are glad that we can meet people here that we otherwise might not meet in our day-to-day -day lives and learn from them and have our eyes opened. You love the music, singing in the choir, Pastor Andy's sermons, the stories of our elders, Walt and Delia dancing up front, helping in the kitchen, yakking at social hour. One person believes that the social hall is a truer reflection of who we are than the sanctuary. As Roger Stevens calls it, the social hall is our family room. And indeed, we are family. One mother said that the church had wrapped itself around her child. We love all the fundraiser events where we can get to know each other better those in our two small group ministries, which have been going for over four years, spoke about how, how important that fellowship is. 
Two very important new small groups have formed during the pandemic. Our Tuesday night talks led by the Mount Marvelous Megan Schindler and our Wednesday night happy hour facilitated skillfully by Dallas Lyle. All of these events and groups have created deeper relationships. As one person said, we grow as we get to know each other, and you value this. So what are your wishes for the future of our church? Many of you wish, of course, that we thrive and continue to work for social justice, that we hold true to our values, that we build our community partnerships, that we continue to be relevant in people's lives, and of course that we find a way to be financially sustainable. You hope that we will have great leadership and great followers, more commitment of time, energy, and money. As Claudia Hume says, you get more out of it if you participate. You hope that we'll have fun. Many wish for a growth in membership to help both with our finances and with the work for a better world. A great many of us wish for greater diversity within our congregation, for more young people, for more people of color. I recently spoke about this longing we have for more to be more racially diverse with Curtis Robinson, the vice president of the NAACP. Interestingly, he said, don't make that your goal. Work alongside people of color on their important issues, and maybe diversity of your congregation will happen organically, or maybe not. But some of you suggest that we at least make connections and engage with congregations of color in some way. I also heard the hope that we could use more inclusive language even when it comes to people who are not politically like us. There's a wish that we continue to use technology for our advantage with hybrid services and meetings and the use of social media. One person hopes that we will have a safety committee. Some of you hope that we will have greater visibility in the community that, let, that we let people know who we are, that we tell our story as another way to live out faith. One person believes that in the future, more people will need a church like ours, that they will want to have this experience. Some of you wish for more modern music, at least some of the time. You think that maybe that will help draw in younger folks? I heard a wish for more joy during worship, as much joy as there is in the social hall. Quite a few of you wish for a more, more of a balance between spiritual needs and activism. There's a desire for more opportunities for spiritual growth, for faith development, and classes to help us get more familiar with the Bible. I heard that coffee hour is difficult for shy people and we need a way to make that better. You hope that we can stay harmonious no matter what lies ahead. And of course, there is a wish for a happy transition to a new pastor, and that the new pastor should be as spicy as Pastor Andy. No vanilla for us. When it comes to the building, I think everyone understands that it's a very large structure for a very small congregation, and there are several drawbacks like no parking and no green space. A couple of people felt that it was incongruous for such a progressive church to be in such an old-fashioned building. One person said that they find themselves during worship redecorating the sanctuary in their minds. Quite a few of you are reconciled to the idea that financially we may not be able to stay in this building. Many of you say, the church is the people, not the building. We can be a church anywhere. And yet, many of you hope and pray we can stay in this beautiful, majestic, historic building. For some, it feels like home. You love the stained glass, you love the worshipful feeling in the sanctuary. You enjoy the wonderful acoustics. 
you say the building has a neat vibe. Many have spoken about the importance of being a downtown church. You have pride and awe about the history of the building. Some of you spoke of how when we are in the sanctuary, we are in the company of all the saints who have gathered and worshiped here for well over a century. Pam Beckstead said that the building is as much a part of Spokane as the river itself. Alan Borgens, who came to Westminster as a child and has been so instrumental in the care of this building, tells of how the people of Westminster have been taking good care of this building, making repairs and improvements since day one. Day one being 1890. He objected to me using the word cranky in relation to the building because actually it's in really good shape. Our treasurer, Randy Crow, says the building is not a liability, it's an asset. We are privileged to be the stewards of his, this historic building, he says. And yet Patty Ferguson fervently wishes that our congregation will be here for her children's children, for Sam and Annie's children, so that they will have a choice other than a megachurch. So she asks, is the work of the church to keep the church building alive or to keep the church community alive? The question before us is, can we do both? Some of you who have been here a long time say we have always struggled financially and always will. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. As Doris Holdaway says, being on edge keeps us alert. And we are very lucky to have the reserves we have. So we all need to stay engaged and to put all our heads together as we look for opportunities for the way forward. In the near future, I will be inviting everyone to participate in groups to keep us thinking about this. But the very next thing we need to do in our Ecclesia project, our very next step toward a sustainable future is to create our pastoral search team that will help us find a pastor who will join me forward with us after Pastor Andy retires. So I am inviting you to submit nominations for this team. In that light, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what this team will do. The work of the search team over the next few months will be fairly intense. It will be guided by our conference minister, Mike Denton, who was here with us last week. The first work of the team will be to create a church profile, and they will consult us as a congregation to create that profile, which we hope to have finished by the end of November. There will probably be some lull-in activity over Christmas, but right afterwards, the search team will begin looking at pastor profiles, interviewing, and discerning. When the team finds the person they believe is a good fit for us, we will all have a chance to hear that pastor preach, to interact with them, and to get to know them. We will then, as a congregation, vote on whether or not we want to hire the pastor who has been presented to us. So that is the work of the search team coming up. Our bylaws specify that the church council selects the search team, but our church council would like to know who you trust. Who would you trust for this important work? So I invite you to submit to me your nominations of the wisest people of the church. I ask you to email me or snail mail me or hand me a piece of paper with your nomination, which should include your name, the person's name of who you're nominating, and a sentence or two about why you consider them to be a wise person of the church. Now be sure to check with that person that you're going to nominate to be sure that they would like to serve on the search team before you actually nominate them. I'd like to have all of your nominations by October 6th. The council will be making their selections on October 7th. And I'm going to send out an email this week with this request so you'll have the details uh, and be reminded of what I've just said.
When we, as a congregation, look toward the future, it's foggy. There's no clear vision. We do not know who our next pastor will be. We can't yet see our path into a sustainable future. But when we look around right here and now, it's not foggy. We find ourselves in the sunshine, and we believe that we will find a way to continue and to thrive. We believe we can take one step forward at a time, and the fog will clear as we go. We are not wringing our hands with furrowed brows. We are not jumping ship because we think it's sinking. We are basking in the sunshine of this beloved community, this group of God-loving, Jesus-following, big-hearted folks. And we have faith in the things we cannot yet see. We are joyfully moving together into that unknown future with God in our midst, and it makes my heart sing. <laughs>